Well, welcome to Worship at Bethany. We're so thrilled that everyone is here today. I just want to recognize that today is a special Sunday for many reasons, really for 44 reasons. That's how many kids are receiving their communion for the very first time. And so we're thrilled that they're here. And actually, let's give them a hand right now because they made it. All right, we had a lot of fun yesterday talking about communion and why it's a means of grace and why it's a way to open up our hearts and minds uh, to God's way in our life. And so congratulations again to families and extended families who are here today. Uh, so how many of you like taking tests? Uh, like most people, you probably don't like to take exams. I know I don't. Uh, back in college, in my undergrad years, I took a, 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 I took a test and I, I was so afraid I was going to fail this thing that I made a plan to cheat. I'm not proud of it, but, you know, we're in church, so let's be honest. Just between you and me, don't tell anybody. I just, I made this plan uh, because the professor said, this is going to be an essay form, which is kind of funny. I thought I would cheat on that, but uh, it's going to be essay form. And he even gave us the, the, the subject of the essay. And, and he said, you can bring a dictionary into class. Uh, in case you need to help with spelling words. And so my plan that I hatched was I was going to find the largest dictionary on campus, and I was going to bring it into class. But before doing so, the night before, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write out the whole essay on the back of the front cover of the dictionary. I know, clever and sad at the same time. So, uh, so that's what I did, and it came time for the test, and I, I brought uh, the dictionary in, and, and I was thinking, you know, if I need it, I'll just flip it open uh, with my foot, and then, you know, flip it back, uh, so, you know, no one will be able to see it. So uh, it came time for the test, and I was very nervous. I, this was exhausting for me. I was sweating. It was awful. And uh, I got to the point, we got to the point where we sat down to the essay, and you see, I had spent so much time the night before writing this essay in the back of, uh, of the front cover of the dictionary that I actually internalized everything that I wrote down, and it turned out I didn't need to look at it once. I had memorized the whole thing the night before. I actually did the homework the night before that I was supposed to do anyway for the essay. I never felt more guilty for getting an A, even though I never cheated on the test. Why? I don't know. I just don't like taking tests. Do you? People don't. And yet, um, what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks in this series is we're going to take a look at the events leading up to the crucifixion. And through these events, we're going to see that God was actually looking at these events and he was doing an examination of the human soul. That, that the Gospel of Matthew the, 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 was written in such a way that it, you know, of the events of, of Jesus' arrest and trial, um, but it was written in such a way that it was the human race through God's eyes that was on trial. And, and so uh, we should be able to see ourselves in these stories if we're careful and we look, and it makes us a little nervous to talk about God examining us, but as we look at these events, we're going to be able to see and learn where we are in these events, and we're going to learn about why Jesus uh, did what he came to do. So that's what we're going to do over the next several weeks, and it's going to lead us up to Resurrection Sunday and the celebration of Easter. So, Exhibit A, today we're going to talk about Judas, and Judas, his story starts in an unusual place where we picked up our reading just a second ago, and I'm going to read uh, that portion and then extend a little beyond that uh, where Judas shows up. So if you have your Bibles, you can take your Bibles out. We've been using the New Living Translation, translation because it's a little easier to read on the screens. We have some in the front in, of your rows. You can take those. Those are free. It's a different translation. Or you can open up your, your phone or your Bible. So again, this is Matthew 26, verse 6. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy, to whom Jesus healed. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume, poured it over his head. The other gospel accounts tell us that the name of this woman is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who Jesus raised. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. 
But Jesus, aware of this, replied, why criticize, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And he's not saying to neglect the poor. He's simply saying you should take advantage of the time that you have with me now just as she has. She's poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. In other words, one day you're going to be telling the story of my death and resurrection to the whole world, and you're going to recount how dull you were and how perspe- perceptive she was. Verse 14. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Fast forward, Jesus and his disciples, they find a private room, the famous upper room uh, in Jerusalem as they were celebrating Passover. Judas joins back with them, and it goes on. While they were eating, uh, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? Now let's pause and talk about this for a second and talk about Judas. Sometimes we have this idea that Judas is this sinister presence, kind of shifty eyes and the shady disciple, always trying to undermine the the rest of the disciples. But that's not really accurate about Judas. You notice when Jesus said somebody would betray him, the, the group didn't look at each other and go, yeah, that was probably Judas. He probably did it because you know how Judas is. No, nobody was expecting that it was going to be Judas. He was, in fact, one of the most respected disciples in the whole group. And we know this because he was given uh, responsibility of the purse. And you, and you don't, you know, you don't hire the shifty one, the, the one you can't trust to be your accountant. And so he had genuinely believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. So when Jesus tells them someone will betray him, uh, they all look around and they say, Lord, is it I? And he replied, one of you have just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me, for the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who betrayed him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, "Uh, you have said it. So Judas then gets up from the table, and he takes off, and he gets the soldiers to ambush Jesus. Now, the first thing we need to see in this story of Judas is this, that Judas represents all of us. He's not just this lone villain out there. Matthew tells the story in a way to show us that he is you and he is me. The other thing that we need to explore today is why. Why did Judas betray Jesus, and how are we tempted in doing the same thing in the same ways? Okay, first, why do we say that Judas represents us? Well, because the way that the story is told, Matthew shows us that, for example, all the disciples had the same reaction to the woman who who, uh, broke the perfume jar on Jesus' feet. And then when Jesus tells the disciples that someone will betray him, he presents it more as a question. He doesn't say we have a traitor among us and it's him. Uh, He leaves out the who, and the word he uses for betray means to hand over or sell. Jesus is basically saying, one of you will sell me out for the right price. Is it you? Look into your hearts. They understood the question because you notice the way they answered it was very um, hesitant, and it was, they didn't have any, <laughs> any confidence whatsoever. You should read it like, uh, is it me, Lord? I, it's not me. Is it me? Jesus goes on to tell them, and it's, it's not just one of you that will sell me out. In verse 31, he says, you will all fall away. They may not have sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, But none of them will go all the way with Jesus either. They have a price. They have a price whereby they will walk away from Jesus, and a price is a price. The question being asked to these disciples was, what is your price? Look into your hearts and ask. Judas may do it spectacularly, but they all will do it eventually. In fact, Peter, the most outspoken of them all, will be the one who in a few days will actually say, I don't even know the man. 
So Judas' betrayal is, is presented as a question. What is your price? What is my price? Well, I found out what mine was. It was years ago. I was on a summer mission trip uh, to East Africa, and I was spending the summer uh, with a, a friend of mine who was working for Habitat for Humanity International. And I remember it so well because there was at some point as we were traveling around Malawi that, uh, that he had an emergency and he had to leave me in a, in a village for a couple nights while he tended to this emergency. And so there I was um, in the middle of the Malawan jungle. I'm not kidding. And it was a small village. They didn't have any electricity. It was very dark. I was the only American there. And uh, they showed me where I was going to sleep, which was in the back room of one of the huts on a dirt floor. Um, that had um, no plumbing or no anything, no running water. And I remember that night very well because I prayed like I never prayed before because I was paranoid, I was afraid, and I found my line. I found my price. I said, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go home. I mean, I was committed to Jesus, and, and I answered the call, but no, I couldn't do it beyond that. I found my price, I found my line, and we all have it. Let me ask you, what is your price? I mean, maybe you're willing to follow Jesus when it's convenient, but at what point do you stop? I mean, maybe you downplay your commitment to Jesus uh, among your friends or among your colleagues because you don't want to be looked at as being strange. After all, you know other Christians, you don't want to be seen like that or something like that. Or maybe it's some area of your life that you just don't want to give control over to God because you don't really trust God that he's smart enough to be able to take care of that part of your life. Or maybe it's some kind of habit or some certain relationship that you know know you need to end, but you just simply don't want to. Some of you know that you work too much and you need to spend more time with your family, but maybe, or maybe he's calling you to do something with your finances and put them first in your finances and generate more generosity and you're resisting him. Or maybe it's simply committing to the church. You know you should be more involved, but you value, um, uh, it feels too inconvenient because you kind of value being non-committal and the freedoms that come with it. Um, does your commitment to Jesus stop at inconvenience? Whatever it is, that's your price. That's where your commitment to Jesus stops and you sell him out. I sell him out. All of us have one or have had one. And so the whole, whole human race is being depicted here. Judas represents you and me, and maybe you haven't actually done what Judas has done. But the stuff in our hearts is the same. Which is another reason why it's so remarkable that what Jesus did. Because even though we might have a line and a price that we're not going to cross, Jesus crossed that line for us. He was willing to go all the way for you and for me, which is why we talk about salvation as a gift. Because he went all the way, it's now gifted to us, um, not because of what we have committed to, but because of what Jesus committed to. Right, that's where our Lutheran heritage, that's, it was founded on this doctrine of justification that cites Paul in Ephesians. Martin Luther's kind of cited Paul in Ephesians that says, For by grace, and grace is unmerited favor, for by grace, not because of your, your righteousness, not because you attended, not because of how well you have behaved in your life, but by grace, unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. And faith sim means simply trusting in what Christ has done for me, not trusting in what you can do for Christ, or not trusting in what you intend to do for Christ. He goes on, and this, and this, that word this in the Greek is written in such a way that it points to the previous phrase, which is to say, um, even faith to trust in Jesus is a gift from God. It's something God puts in your heart. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, not the result of coming to church consistently. It's not a result of good morals. It's not the result of saying, no, it is, um, it is because of what Christ has done 
so that no one may boast your salvation from start to finish belongs to Christ. It belongs to God. Sometimes we get this idea that salvation is kind of like this picture where maybe you're, you're, you're um, swimming in an ocean of maybe your sin or sorrow or death or whatever, and you see Christ over there, and you kind of swim over to Christ, say, Jesus, you're, save me, save me, and he sends the preserver over, and he, he pulls you up into the boat. That's not really an accurate picture of, of what we're talking about. A more accurate picture is uh, that uh, is not where we're swimming to Jesus. And sometimes we think that's what we have to do. We're swimming, we're swimming, we're trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. But a more accurate picture is that we are already dead in the water, face down, and Jesus comes along and lifts us back into the boat, and he brings us back to life. That's the new life. That's the resurrection life. That is more accurate picture of what salvation as a gift looks like so we're not saved, we're saved not because of how committed we are to Christ, but because of how committed he was to us. So let's go back to Judas for a second. Why then, why did Judas do this? Why did he betray Jesus? Well, maybe the first one is the short answer, because he was disappointed in Jesus. Have you ever been disappointed by God? Judas had expectations about the Messiah, and Jesus didn't meet those expectations. Like, for example, Judas wanted a Messiah who would punish evil and reward the righteous. Instead, Jesus came preaching grace to outsiders, and that made people mad. Because when you think you're a rule follower, nothing makes you madder than when God uh, rewards those who don't follow the rules that you've been following. Jesus' message was that all of us, at our very best, fall far short and need a Savior. We're all outsiders who need to be rescued. That, so thank God he extends grace to outsiders because that's all there is, are outsiders. But Judas didn't want to see that about himself. Judas preferred to see himself as someone better than others, someone more worthy of respect, someone more worthy of being rewarded. And so he missed Jesus altogether. But you know who did get this? It was the woman who broke that perfume jar, Mary. What did she do? She was so overwhelmed with love and gratefulness to him that she washed his feet with her tears, said Scripture. In a similar, similar situation, Jesus explained, the reason people like her love him so much is she realizes how much I've forgiven her. And he's not saying that because he forgave her more than anybody else. He shares that because um, she just simply realized it more than others. The reason some of us love Jesus so little is that we have little awareness of how desperate our condition was before him and before he saved us. So Judas wanted a Messiah that would punish evil and reward righteousness. The woman understood the Messiah came to bestow grace because there were none who were righteous. And then Judas also wanted a Messiah that would bestow power and, and riches. He thought the Messiah would give him the good life. And the woman understand knowing Jesus was the good life. So, so that's an important distinction. Jesus thought the Messiah would give him the good life, but, the, but Mary, she knew Jesus was the good life. See, Judas thought Jesus as useful. Mary thought of him as beautiful. Something that is useful is a helpful tool to a, obtain something else that you want. If God is useful to you, that means you're using God to get something else that you want, whether it's safety for your family or whether it's good health or whether it's financial security or whether it's this or that. Regardless, if God is useful to you, it means that you are looking at him more like a tool, but, but something that is beautiful you love for in and of itself. I, uh, you know... A tire iron is useful. I keep one in my car in case I need it, and if it breaks, I throw it away. My kids and my wife are beautiful to me. I love them just because of who they are, and, you know, I, I don't use them so in the hopes that someday they're going to, you know, somehow 
create a million dollars for me, although that would be nice. That's not why I love them. That's not why I keep them around. I don't throw them away because sometimes they are broken. Judas's find Jesus useful. Mary's find him beautiful. That means you can tell whether you're Judas or Mary by how you respond to life's, um, how life disappoints you. Right? If you say, God, this may not be my preference and it may hurt like crazy, but if this broken circumstance, if you can use it so that I can know you better, or if I can use it so that I can share with somebody else um, how important you are, then I'm not going to like it at all, but nevertheless, I'm going to take it because knowing you is the better treasure than anything else my circumstances can do. If you can get there, then you know you're, you're more of a Mary. The question is, which way are you learning, leaning? Are, are you saying, God, I'm going to love you conditionally. I'm going to lean towards Judas. You better do this, this, and this for me or else. Or are you leaning these days toward Mary? God, whatever happens, I love you and I'm going to pursue you no matter what because I trust no matter what happens in my life. I am going to be okay because of what you have done for me. I don't know what your struggle, where you're leaning this morning, but let me just encourage you to think less of God as a tool to get somewhere for the good life and instead think of serving God for God's self. Catch that? So I want to encourage you to think less uh, using God for a purpose of your own and think of your purpose in life as loving God for who he was and what he has is and what he has done for you. And if you can get there, then what's going to happen is you're going to begin to see as God sees. And you're going to be able to experience in any circumstances whatsoever, no matter what happens in the future or what has happened in the past, you will be able to begin to experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, and you will be able to experience the kind of love that you can't get from anybody else, and ultimately you will be able to experience the kind of joy that comes with a resurrection morning. Which way are you leaning these days? And let me encourage you for the latter. Don't think of God simply as a, as a means to the good life, but rather just simply love God for who he is and what he's done for you and let him take care of the rest. And that will give you the opportunity to grow in grace and know that kind of grace and you will live from a place of gratitude like never before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all have lines and we have a price and we admit it. We do things because we you know, value self-preservation. We come from a place of fear. We're all on this journey, Lord. And so I pray that you might wrap us in your arms in a way that we will expand that line. We will grow to trust you more, and as a result, we'll be able to love you no matter where you take us. And we know that in our mind, we want to get it into our hearts that Jesus, our salvation has come because of Jesus' commitment to us and not the other way around. And so we want to live from gratitude for the rest of our life. So breathe your spirit into us once more, Lord. We call upon your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.